Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 2024 New Jersey International Film Festival Filmmaker Q&A session. And today we have a special guest. We have actually the subject of the film, as well as the director here to do the Q&A with us. So I'll introduce them to you in a second. The 2024 New Jersey International Film Festival will have its 29th iteration between May 31st and June 9th on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Our festival is still a hybrid festival, which means it'll be online as well as have in-person shows. Your ticket is good for both. And yes, there are some crazy people that watch the movie online during the day and then come to the screening in the evening and they interact with the filmmakers that way. So uh, you're welcome to do that. The ticket is good for both of those things. Um, the festival will be taking place at Rutgers University, which is the beautiful state university located in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Our space is Voorhees Hall, room 105. It's a 250 seat theater that's really, really well outfitted for screenings. And we're doing concerts too. So maybe Hyperbubble can come, but well, that's another question I will ask you. And um, the festival itself will be um, uh, 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 something that we'll talk about at the end of the Q&A. So uh, Jeff DeCure is here. He is the mastermind or half of the mastermind of the pop duo Hyperbubble. We're going to be talking about the movie that was made about them by this wonderful guy next to me. His name is Joe Wallace. And welcome, guys. Thank Thanks you for joining Thanks us. Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You know, I always ask the most inane question at the very beginning, and I asked that to the director, Joe. How did you get involved in making this film? Please tell us the genesis of it. Well, you know, um, Jeff and I and Hyperbubble go a long way back. And so uh, we were recording music together before they even had a band called Hyperbubble uh, wow. in, in its current form. And so when they started their career, I was there for these, you know, these early works, the first records, you know, their first vinyl records and things like that. And so when it felt like time to do something like this, we all just kind of looked at each other and said, we, we should do this. I mean, it's, it's been a journey and, you know, I was never in Hyperbubble, yeah. but um, I kind of took this journey with them. And so it's, it's been one of those things where life and circumstances you know, took us apart and brought us back together. And uh, as that journey kind of unfolded, you know, the germ of this idea started growing. And then we, one day we just all looked at each other and it looked like we were ready to do it. Yeah, it looks like you're a drummer. I see that symbol behind you. At least we share that in common, I think, because I was I'm a, a novice. I'm, I am I have only started in the last three months. It's sort of been oh a bucket gosh. for me. So, yeah, I'm I'm learning a lot at a very late stage in the game for somebody, you know, to take up a new instrument, but uh, it's been very exciting. Yeah. I had a pair of Ludwigs that was given to me by a guy who was, in, I was in a band and I said, I want to learn how to play the drums. This was in the seventies. And then I morphed to a TD seven, which I'm sure Jeff mm. knows all about the, the synthesized drumming that's out there. That's kind of an old system from the nineties. And so I know a lot about music. I was in bands too. So I, I must tell you, though, I laughed so hard during this film. It's so much fun. Not only do you learn about these two guys and you kind of take the journey about how they made their 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 music and what they're doing now. But I think it's a film that's more than a film. It's not a promo film, although it is somewhat. Right. Do you see it that way, Jeff? I mean, do you see it as a promotional film or as a, a unique think, piece think, of original I think, film? I think it's like. You know the movie El Topo, where you think you're watching a cowboy western, and all of a sudden you're going, "What in the world is going on here?" So it starts <laughs> off kind of smelling a little bit like a promo, and then all of a sudden it kind of like you're going, "Wait, wait!" I, yeah, it's doing things that, not. that uh, documentaries don't do. For example, the guy standing on the left hand side of the screen, you know, mm -hmm. with something mm -hmm. behind him. You know, we play around with that. We start with that, and then we go, "Okay." We love watching all those behind the music, some history of bands. Yeah, yeah. So we're thinking, how can we play around with the format? Well, let's add animations, let's add interviews. But uh, one of the things we wanted to do with the film, too, was as we start to tell our story, start to promote the artists who, who encouraged us and who came before us. That's very true. And, you know, I, I teach El Topo in my cult films in American culture. <laughs> 
and I, you know, it's getting more challenging to show that movie because of the Me Too movement and Joe Dorowski was a skewered uh, because of all this. He was, he'd say he was a bit of a cad. He really was a cad for sure. But he's still alive. He's in the, no, he, I, I think he's still alive, right? In his late nineties, I think. Or maybe he's still with us as far as I know. Yeah, I think so too. But uh, I understand, Jeff, that you were involved in the animation process of this film. Tell us about that. Um, it was interesting because um, what I did it with was uh, not in any particular animation program, but it, it was an Adobe Premiere. Mm. And it was done through keyframing and through green screen. And just, you know, we're talking about drumming. I started drumming in bands when I was like 15 years old and playing at clubs and stuff. Mm. And I wasn't a I wasn't like the world's greatest drummer when I started, but I was like, they said, so we need a drummer in our band. And I went, Hey, I'll, I'll come in your band and <laughs> jumped in. I was like, okay, well, I got a drum. And that was kind of what happened with some, a lot of the animation is like, well, we want to do these animation things. We know what our limitations are. We know what our strengths are, you know? So we, we, we kind of came up with a, um, an approach that would that would allow us to work within our limitations, but at the same time, kind of have that sleight of hand where you think you're more things happening than they actually are. So a lot of it was using the keyframing to kind of like, like when you know when you're driving in traffic and you want to take a left turn, but a car is coming your way, you want to kind of figure out how much you can go to the <laughs> left before hitting it, so, or how you're going to throw the baseball. It's going to make it over the plane after you throw a curve. It was kind of like that. It was a lot of guesswork and just playing around with the program, but. Uh, by no means, you know, it, it was it, you know, was it any I, kind of complicated I think thing. You do a master, you do a masterful job. I mean, I think I, I swear to God, I as soon as I saw the cat cam, I, you know, I'm a, <laughs> I was just, I was so happy. I said, my wife, you got to come and see the cat cam in this film. Well, my wife and I do a lot of humane work saving stray cats. So there's mm -hmm. that side of it. But the way that the cat kind of calls the shots in that scene <laughs> is exactly what our cats do in this house. They kind of, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. They know when to push the right people. button. Yeah, you know cats like. They, they find out what you're paying attention to at the moment and they just plop themselves right in the middle of it. So like you were playing Monopoly, they'll just go <laughs> walk right in the middle of the board and they dig me. That's kind of where that idea from Candy Apple Dray Dreams came from. Uh, oh, again, wow. we, we're, the problem solving part was like, okay, this cat's mad at us about something, but we don't want to look like we're mean to cats. So we made yeah. it something fairly innocuous. Where the cat is really about. in control. Where the cat's yeah, okay, in control. Yeah. yeah. Sure. You know, and just as a weird aside, one of the things I love about the cat element of the movie is how much randomness it's brought into our lives. We heard, now I'd never heard of this website before, but there's something called catsynth.com. Mm. And they reached out to us and I was just so blown away at not just the concept of this, but like the creativity and the passion that was invested in it. Mm. And that's one of the things I love about the experience of being on this film is finding these strange little asides and like side journeys, like the cat stuff. Yeah, yeah. So that's always hey, been I love. There's there's a, a user group called Cats and Synthesizers in Space. Wow. Uh, there's a solo artist called Cat Temper. There's a guy that does like grindcore. <laughs> you what? Mean, cats, I don't. Know. That's cats, crazy. You know, but, <laughs> so, so something wait. about cats and synthesize. Maybe it's the neatness and the cleanness or something. Or I, I'm not sure. I just want to make sure though, whose cat is it? In, in that particular video? Yeah. That was, that was our beloved cat Smokey. All right. And, 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 and seriously, no cats were harmed in making the video. He was <laughs> you saw you saw the part where they were interviewing the filmmakers. Yeah, he yeah. was chewing on the set too. It was just sort of like he was such a natural ham. So to get him to like look places and do stuff, it was just simple. He was doing really. it already. It was taking a, cat, a vibrating cat toy and like putting it inside a bag or putting yeah. something behind a piece of the step. It was like he was curious about, you know, so you want to touch it. And so guessing ways to make him make certain <laughs> cat gestures. And we built a stunt paw, which was like a yes, little. Yes, yes, I, I saw that. It looked pretty convincing, though. I, I didn't know it was. But... The director, like, a little stuff. bit of baby, baby powder on it to give it kind of a natural gray and white look, you know? We managed to sidestep breaking the other rules of film, never work with the water or with children with, or, or with, with animals. animals. And we broke yeah. the animals rule, but I think it was, I was motivated and justified, I think. I think definitely it's, it. And it's great that that's how you hooked me anyway. And then I said, 
Wow. And you're playing the, and Jess is playing the theremin and you guys are an item. You've been together for so long and, and you're in a band together and you're traveling around and you're having a great time and you're doing what you love, which is exactly what I think everybody should do. And I, you know, I, I wonder. Yeah, that's kind of what the film is really about, isn't it? You know, in, in general, that was the goal of the film was being that we, we come from areas of education and we're teachers. Right. We want the film to inspire. We want anybody who's ever had a creative idea to be encouraged. Hmm. So tell me, I think in the movie you say how you met each other. Is that really true? What we see in the movie, how you met Jess? Um, how I met Jessica? It's, yeah. it, it's another film story, man. Are you familiar with the director, Craig Baldwin? Yes, of course. The, He's okay, the master. He He's a friend of mine. He's a found footage master. Really? Well, it's all his fault, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your fault, Craig. What <laughs> happened was there, was there was a screen of Craig Baldwin's film, Sonic oh, Outlaws. I know. Uh, it, it was about it was about like a culture jamming, and it had like negative land in it. The Barbie Liberation Brigade, and this is stuff I was, and, and our director Joe has always been fascinated by this particular area of culture, and uh, so I went out to. Uh, an art gallery where this is screening to actually promote my CD and my band. And yeah. also because I was interested in the film and my wife to be was like four or five aisles back. And I didn't know it at the time, but um, I didn't know who she was at the time, but there was, she was like chatting with somebody and actually, actually shushed her. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. Right. She was like, anyway, so, so we, so after the film got out, we, uh, the film let out, and a, a friend of mine who I'd been in the band with since I was 15 mm. years old introduced yeah. us because they knew each other. And it turned out she and I had been going to the same college, the same art class. We both had printmaking degrees, oh. and it instantly clicked once we did finally meet. Yeah, you guys definitely have the chemistry, and I think it's just wonderful watching you interact. And I guess the other question I had as a band, how difficult is it just going out as a as a duo? I mean, I know sometimes you have other musicians with you, but in general, when you began, was it something that, you know, filling the sound and the space, was it something that you found difficult and was it hard for the audience to grasp that? Or is it something I, I, depends I on the venue, with, I guess. I think with this particular type of music, mm -hmm. you have a lot that's allowed to you. You know, if you're like in a heavy metal band or mm -hmm. a, a band or, or some sort of guitar proficiency is in, uh, involved. Yeah. People expect you to have a full band with eight members up there performing. But if you're doing something that's a synthesizer band, I mean, by its very nature, the aesthetic of synth pop is minimalism and uh, stripping things down to its core. Yeah. And having been in a band for so many years, it's really, it's really more down to being able to trust the other person in the band to know that you can go do your thing on stage and that your, your partner's doing their thing and, and you don't even have to worry about it. And so that was the strongest thing with like both members could trust each other in this band. Mm -hmm. So there, there was really no fear when we, when we performed at all, because, you know, we were there, we were there for each other, you know, and, and yeah. the audience got to join in on the fun and we were clearly having fun and the audience just sort of, Oh, okay. Just, <laughs> they gave into the fun, you know. And it, I, yeah. I think that's it. You know, like bands like Depeche Mode, when they when they began touring, they had a reel to reel tape player sitting on stage. You <laughs> go push the button and the thing would roll, you know. And to me, that's cool. That's that's part of the art of their presentation. It's true. And the White Stripes and other bands that can get away with doing just the duo. But you know, I think Jessica had she had already been in bands and she had already made a mark as a singer. And I think the kind of bringing yourself into play, the, I mean, you guys obviously know what each other are thinking at times. I mean, I, that chemistry is very visible to me, but I guess I should be kind to Joe and ask him, what was the, what was the most difficult thing that you did making this film? And what was the easiest thing that you did? Or the thing that you enjoyed the most, maybe I should say phrase. The it. thing I enjoyed the most was how much with one mind we all began thinking when we would, you know, we would we got into the the recording room in Nashville. And from that moment, it was like the band is doing their thing and I'm doing my thing, and it's all kind of just clicking together. And 
the the meshing that happened without a lot of like pre-planning or anything like that it was just very natural and you know when you know people well and you know them that well that you can yeah. kind of go on autopilot with some things it makes the entire shoot feel a lot different the hardest thing and this i didn't really give two seconds worth of thought about at the time but mm -hmm. now in hindsight looking back gutting out covid and sitting on this film was the hardest thing for me mm -hmm. because you really we really didn't know if when covid was over was anybody even going to care was are we going to have moved on from this you know or is society is is our societal tone getting darker and it turns out no there was a hunger and an appetite for positive upbeat like let's let's reach up and you know let's put this terrible stuff behind us and mm -hmm. let's find the joy in our lives again you know and so when covid ended we were looking at each other saying do we still have a thing that we should put in front of people's faces and the answer was a resounding yes we want positive we want fun we don't want to deal with the miasma of all that stuff we want to come and just get away from all that and so the joy of that outweighed the difficulty of gutting it out but yeah covid was really hard i mean making films is all about momentum and i i know exactly what you mean yeah uh, i think a lot of people who sat on their documentary stuff were able to edit it but if you're in the middle of shooting then you, you can't really do that so it's yeah. really difficult and i think for bands too will i ever be able to tour again and you know i i went to so many concerts after the pandemic yeah. ended and, and a lot of the performers were saying that to the audience, you know, we didn't know if be able to be back. Jeff, did you feel the same way? Um, I didn't necessarily feel the same way about performing myself because yes. I, the, the, the movie project was so me and Joe locked in our rooms <laughs> editing while a lot of this was going on. Yeah, but yeah. I did see a lot of my, my fellow musicians in, in the music scene that, that, like oh god we got to play that's who yeah, i am yeah, yeah. Uh, but it did it did give us a different perspective for sure and one thing joe was telling us was you know people are going to want a couple of laughs after, after all this is over absolutely uh, and so and so yeah it, it it didn't really slow down our production but what's interesting if you while i was editing hmm. I, you know i have the news on in the background the whole time so if i go and look at all the stuff that was on the floor in the editing room you can like watch eight years worth of news including the covid and a couple of elections and all that you know <laughs> in the background as i'm as i was sort of cutting into the key scenes mm -hmm. so that was interesting to me when i went back to look at the older reddits to see like wow i kind of had this on the back of me in the editing room there's like a, a tv that got caught on screen but where, where it was an advertisement for a very fashionable looking uh mask <laughs> where it's like wow i, I should have videotaped that you know we didn't know if it was going on forever. Yeah. So in, in a lot of that was, it just made, it, it kind of made it seem like too, that, hey, look, anything goes. <laughs> you, know, you, you, think there, you think the movie's ready to come out? You think you got a plan? Well, guess what, guys? <laughs> you can do anything you want. Uh, yeah, sure. but as far as playing live though, mm. it's, it, we kind of lucked out in that sense because the decision to make the film was based on the idea of, we want to tour the film. We want to have the film go places. Right, we right. can't go. And, and mm. The film can take a lot more wear and tear than I can these days, partner. And <laughs> as far as like airplanes and you know, and, and stages yeah. at two a.m. and stuff, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was really glad that uh, Joe submitted the film because I mean, you guys have been on the tour on the festival circuit for a while, and I thought, why haven't I heard about this film? And I thought that it was, it was magical, and it was really, really something I I wanted to show. I. I was on the jury, I was on the documentary jury, and I thought, wow, you know, this is so much fun. We've got to absolutely show it. And I think that I didn't know anything about you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm very upfront about that, but I've since bought some of your stuff. So you've made a fan out of me and I <laughs> explored your band camp page. And I That's mean, you got to awesome. check them out. Yeah, yeah you got to check are, out. We are, very, we are very happy that you connected with us because really what kind of art we make, it, it really, Banks on that. It banks on going, okay, we know that 90% of people out there are going to see this movement and go, oh, God, that's weird. What is this? But some people are going to, oh, man, it's going to hit them right on. Yeah. And we started hearing back from me. It was like, oh, this guy gets it. He totally gets where we're coming from with this thing. 
Well, that, yeah. the fact that the fact that you guys are artists, I think, resonated with me. And then then you told me that you're both artists and teachers, and it it made so much perfect sense for me. But my, I guess my last question before I show our audience how they can buy tickets is, how did you end up getting Ricardo Audubon to be the narrator for the film? Oh. Um my band uh, had toured, Hyperbubble had toured yeah. London, gosh, I want to say it was 2014 or something. And we had, we played at the Lexington in London with uh, Helen Love and uh, Phil Jupitus and the Lovely Eggs. And we were invited by Helen and her keyboard player was, uh, uh, live keyboard player was Ricardo. And when we oh, arrived yeah. in London and met each other, it was just, we just clicked. You clicked, and yeah. Ever since we had that meeting in London, uh, we didn't really talk, have had a chance to talk much that day because there was a show, but we, we knew, hey, we got a connection here. So when we got back to the States, we kept in touch and we talked projects. And when it came time to do the uh, film, uh, Joe and I were talking about what would really give this some sort of, take it out of it being just somebody talking about themselves was have somebody across the pond talk about this particular yeah. song. Yeah. There's a British guy talking about this Texas band going to Nashville. <laughs> band going to Nashville. That's a neat little quirky mix. And I would say, you know, this I, I always feel like I'm on a mission to encourage, you know, aspiring filmmakers and struggling filmmakers. And the overriding principle for Ricardo Audubon and everybody else that's in the film is the title of that Terry Gross book. All I did was ask. And that's been my motivation and my inspiration. And it's like, they, the worst they can do is say no. No, They aren't going to take away my birthday. They're not going to put me in the corner. They're just going to say no. So ask. <laughs> and so That's basically how we pulled the film off was we had Joe and myself and Jessica and our organization had made friends in, in the 20 plus years that we've been making films and, and making music. So it was really just calling up our friends and going, hey, you want to do a funeral scene or do you want to, you know, do you want to be, be in the country band we're putting together for the, the the bluegrass scene? And like Joe said, most of the time they say, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very cool. All right, folks, now we now comes the fun part. we got to show you guys how to get tickets because we're going to be screening this film on Sunday, June 9th which is actually, you guys are next to the closing film for our festival, which is a very prestigious place. And we're going, I paired your film with two other music films. I, I, you know, as a curator, we had 700 films. We only are showing a little bit over 30 of them. So the creme de la creme, so you guys should be very proud. Thank you. But then my job is where do I, which films do I put together? Well, I said, well, this is music, this is music, this is music. And it became very straightforward for me. So let me just share screen. And most of the time people would come to our old website page, which is njfilmfest.com. And by the way, this is the space that we show in. We show at Rutgers University. I'm a cinema studies professor there. And I've been running this festival for 29 years, and I founded it back in 96. And I've been running another festival called the New Jersey Film Festival, which is actually used to just be a film series that I started when I was a graduate student in 1982. We've kind of grown by leaps and bounds and people like Martin Scorsese, um, Todd Salons, uh, all sorts of wonderful filmmakers have come and they've helped boost our profile and now we kind of moved away from doing art house movies. We now really want to do indie films. And we've been doing that for the last two decades. So this place has been home for that long. And when you get to our homepage, you can scroll down or you can click current events, which bounces you to our holding part, which is giving you basic information about the dates and stuff. But you absolutely must punch this red ticket button, which bounces you to our eventive website page. You know, the pandem pandemic screwed everybody, including film festivals, but we were one of the first film festivals to jump on board streaming our festival. And so we, I called a couple of my friends who run other festivals elsewhere and they said, use Eventive. I said, all right, we'll use Eventive. So we've been using them for the last four years and we've had really no issues working with them. So the festival itself will be a hybrid. You can see the film online for 24 hours on the show date. So on June 9th, you can start watching at 12.01 Eastern time and you have 24 hours to finish watching once you start. So let's say you start watching at 11.30 PM. You still can watch the film for 24 hours if you have to go to the bathroom, you got tired, you wanna to go to sleep, 
you can wake up the next day and finish watching it within that 24 hour period. So this is our welcome page, and there's five buttons that you absolutely must push each and every one of them. But scroll down first, you see this part about parking. If you wanna to come to the in-person screening, you can get access to free parking, but you've gotta register your vehicle. You need driving directions, you click that link. We've got our staff, our sponsors listed, and that's the welcome page. You wanna then hit the tickets page, which has all the um, various films that we're showing listed and for documentary you got to go all the way over here because uh the cowgirls and synthesizers is our, one of our last films so you would need to go over here to june 9th you can click learn more to learn more about the film and you click pre-order to buy tickets 15 dollars for the price of admission that includes online and in person and yes we have some crazy people that watch the film during the day at home and then a lot of the times the filmmakers come and they want to in interact with them. So they come to do a Q&A, the filmmakers that evening. And so they come to the show in person. And so they watch the film twice and they interact with the talent that evening. Um, so that's how you can buy tickets. You can also go back to festival site, which bounces you back to the welcome page. You can go to the film guide page. And you can see this wonderful poster that I wanted to put the poster behind me, but it chopped uh, your head off, Jeff. So I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I use this other really great one with you standing in front of the Nashville sign. And you can get information about uh, Jeff's movie right here. You can also buy tickets from this location. You can also go up to the menu page and see that we have a number of things here too. And you go to schedule. This gives you a very vanilla a linear version of the schedule where you can get information about all the films. Yes, the two other movies are Musical Angels by Saul Pincus. He's actually alumnus of our festival. We showed this amazing feature film he did called Nocturne, one of my favorite features we've shown of all time. And he made a film about this magical violin. Um, I won't tell you more about it, but that's the short. And then Live Feed is by Daniel Maldonado. He's also a, a festival alumnus. And he made a film that I think sinks in very nicely with yours, which is by uh, featuring the work of Jeff Morris and the team that he works with. It's a kind of a performance piece. And then of course, Cowgirls and Synthesizers is the film that we'll be showing that evening. So when you're done scrolling through, you wanna work your way back to the homepage and you want to see everything. You can save yourself some money by buying an all access pass the all access pass is 120 bucks. It's about half price if you see everything. And it includes also tickets to a concert that I'm gonna to mention to you. So that when you go back to our homepage, you will see Marissa Nadler. And I wondered if you guys know, uh, Jeff, if you know Marissa Nadler, she's also an artist. And guess what? She lives in Nashville. <laughs> so oh, wow. she's gonna be coming and doing a concert. She's kind of, I mean, I just love her stuff and I become friends with her just like you did, Joe, with Jeff. And she's going to come and do a performance at our festival. We're trying to do audio visual stuff. Yeah, live. Great. But it's great. really like we can only do like one person. And I thought maybe we could get Hyperbubble to come because I think we have a setup that we could do two people. So but that's a discussion for another day. And I throw that out to you. So if you're ever in the area, make sure you reach out to me. But Marissa is going to be there on June 15th to do a concert. We're really proud of that. And I'm going to stop sharing and say thanks to both of you guys for hanging out. Thank you. Show us the albums. Show us the soundtrack album. You have it handy. This is brand How new. How is this, y'all? You got to get it. Yo, I love it. And the Cowgirls and Synthesizers, um, you, can, you can buy it on their Bandcamp page. I highly recommend you check out their music. Like I said, I bought their first two and I'm really proud of that. And I'm working through their collection. And uh, I I don't know, are you guys coming to the screening? I don't think you're coming, but I think you're too far we're away. We're gonna try our darndest to. Uh, I hope you can, we would love to have you. Yeah, yeah, they would be wonderful to meet you guys in the flesh and let us yeah, know. We have can. a niece in, who lives in New York and she is a young filmmaker. She just started uh, taking film classes in her college and uh, she, she loves New York, <laughs> and she she is really interested in filmmakers. So we're we're hoping to do like a double thing, like go see the festival and go see her, and maybe we can even get her to come out to the festival. Yeah, that yeah, for sure. Cool. I mean, we're only forty five minutes to an hour by train. We're a block away 
from the New Brunswick train station and let us know if that happens so that we can publicize it so our, our audience knows. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys both. Thanks both of you. And I look forward to seeing your film on our big screen. It is absolutely Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.